Good evening. It's my pleasure to be part of this webinar. In fact, I'm grateful to Dr. Sharma to connect me with my counterparts in that part of the world and allow me to this opportunity, uh, provide me this opportunity for sharing my thoughts on very interesting topic, changing landscape of higher education and how to excel in such environment. Growing in the foothills of Dholadhar Valley, I never imagined that one day I will become a part of such platform, some such virtual platform to be in the company of the distinguished personalities like Dr. Sharma, Dr. Mishra, Dr. Bhardwaj, Dr. Lata, and many others. So tonight, my plan is just to share with you some of the trends which are taking place around the world, and then uh, have more interaction with many of you to address your questions or share my thoughts or my experiences with you. So let me begin with saying that what is happening in this century, in the past two decades, what are the various trends? All of us are experiencing the same. And the first and the top of the list is that we are part of the connected world called connectism. So connectism is the order of the day. And this itself is an example. You can see that sitting in two different continent, we are able to interact with each other. And I'm sure if this platform is available to the people around the world, all the continents could, be, could have all these participants with whom we can interact. So connectism is the order of the day. The second trend that gone are the days when we will use to call ourselves local. Local word has become now global. And we are all part of the global citizenship. So globalization, which began um, late 70s, early 80s, uh, has another order of the day phenomena. And the third and the foremost, virtualization. So now you could see that we are meeting in a virtual space through the virtual platforms and our interactions are virtual. And again, this has changed the whole working environment worldwide. This has impacted the education drastically. And one of the biggest impact of this virtualization has been in the theory of what we call constructivism. Constructivism where uh, the students and faculty members both are becoming partner to co-construct the knowledge. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on. So these are the few phenomena which are the hallmark of 21st century. As, you, <clears throat> as we all know, that technology is a huge boom and it's also a opportunity and this is a great example of this but at the same time it has also um, um, created many more challenges and i'll talk a little bit about that so one of the biggest challenge so let me first highlight what are the uh, key challenges to higher education in journal I'm here in the US for the last 20, 22 years. And during these two decades, I have seen the enrollments have become a more and more challenge every year. Based on the demographics, we are losing students and every university is fighting to get more and more enrollments. So falling enrollments create challenge to the university because the revenue sources are depleting. And accordingly, the budgets are shrinking. So the falling enrollment is one of the greatest challenge to higher education. It is more in US and I'm sure it is worldwide. 
it's uh, probably the same in India too. The second major challenge is that there are so many online platforms which has opened up in the last couple of years, which are creating a tough competition to the traditional universities. Uh, platforms like MOOC, platform like Coursera, and these have started offering courses where students have a flexibility to attend the uh, courses and take these programs, uh, certificates uh, and degrees and even capitalize from there wherever they are enrolled in. Universities have started accepting many of these credits for their graduations, for their credits. So this has offered another key challenge to higher education and have changed the definition of traditional universities. <clears throat> Everyone talks about the, the job landscape and that job landscape is another thing which is changing drastically. People are talking about do we need to go to university? Do we need the degrees or do we need the competency? Is the competency good enough for people to employ in organizations? So the key terminologies which are coming over skills over degree model. And there's already a lot of discussion going on in higher education that how do the institutions survive in such environment where employers may be looking for more competency than the degrees and diplomas. So that, for, that forces university to rethink about the education model they are delivering. The next scenario which is coming in that we, the students are changing, their demographics are changing, but their profiles are changing. More so in this world, uh, most of my students are, are in mid 40s or mid 50s. A couple of them are in mid 70s. In fact, I had an interesting experience while teaching in uh, India for almost 10, 12 years, when I moved to first Canada, and the very first day in my class, uh, uh, just before the class, I saw a couple of persons hanging out of my class, and they were in mid 70s, and I thought they may be the professors here, and uh, they may have just come to welcome me. As soon as I opened the classroom, they got in. And they asked me, how are you doing? And I said, great. And then they introduced themselves by saying, uh, we have seen your profile and it's a great opportunity for us to be your student. And I was amazed because I never could have thought of that um, in my class, there'll be a students who are almost uh, mid seventies or mid sixties uh, and, and uh, they, they already are accomplished in their own field. And they told me <clears throat> an interesting story that uh, since uh, after their undergraduate degree, they joined military and finally came back and started doing businesses. And they have been very successful. But it is their children and grandchildren who wanted uh, them to complete their masters, to complete their graduate degrees. And it is with that ambition we have joined this program. And today we are in your class. So the demographic and the profile of the students today are changing, which creates a different kind of a challenge for the teachers, for the administrators, uh, the, how to cater to the needs of different learning styles, the different profiles of the people. The second thing uh, which, which I experienced was that the students are seen as the customers, as a consumers, and not as students. They are seen as the partners or the co-partners in this process, which was again a big change for me because uh, having taught in one environment where I thought there was an arm space uh, distance, uh, which was, which was uh, very different when I moved to this part of the world. Um, so here now, because there is so much competition for grabbing students, 
but more competition is to retain students. So retention is one of the hallmark of every university. In fact, there are so many resources spent uh, on retention. In fact, even in our school here, we have a whole uh, division which focuses on how to retain students. Uh, one of the reasons here also is because students can easily migrate or transfer from one university to another university. Uh, also, there is a standardization of credit hours. So the same credit hours could be transferred from one institution to another. So retention is one of the big uh, challenge for all the university. Um, so that was the second thing. And as we were change, as we are getting into this new environment and new challenges, the universities are impacted in a big way. And as you know, in the past uh, couple of months, COVID-19 changed everything. Uh, when it began in early part of the March here, we uh, suddenly had to switch to the virtual settings. And that virtual settings lasted for that semester. Then the summer semester was also in the virtual settings. And because of this, uh, we, we uh, lost a uh, lot of revenue, which used to be generated out of the campus events, about of the, out of the dorms, out of uh, the various other uh, student experiences that we used to have on campus. And as a result, the university are going through these budget cut situations. Um, Currently in our school, we, we lost around 5% budget cut, and they are again reviewing it in another round of uh, uh, this cycle, probably next couple of months, uh, what would be the next uh, uh, budget cuts uh, coming. So actually, uh, the higher education is in a very, very uh, difficult situation at this point in time. As I said, the technology on one hand, the falling um, enrollment on in our hand, and uh, this uh, COVID-19 are, are, are such situation where universities we, are we lost are fighting for the budget. resources. They, they have a crunch of these resources. Now, this is the big pictures, which many of us may not have to worry about because we are all faculty members. We are all... Uh, scientists, we are all researchers, and and much of this uh, planning goes in the hands of the administrators, in the hands of these uh, owners, the policy makers. So what is happening as a result of this to the faculty level? Let let me understand. Um, you know, when when I uh, they, when I started my careers in mid eighties. Uh, the whole idea was that uh, you go in a class with your given agenda, you decide the agenda, what you have to teach in a class, and uh, you, you, you share that with the students. And suppose students are supposed to follow it as in total. Now, in the last two, three decades, how things have changed, that this the instructor-driven uh, pedagogical models have changed to learner center model. In a learner center model, you have to cater to the needs of the learners, which means you cannot go with a fixed agenda. The whole agenda has to be driven by the learner needs based on their learning styles. So I made an adjustment when I came here, what I do even today in my class, when I go the very first day, I, I ask students, what do you think you would like to have five or six takeaways from this class. And I asked them that send me those five, six questions or 10 questions as your takeaways. If I answer those 10 questions through my this class, probably you would think this course was worth. It had value. And if I have 50 students in my class, and on an average, if I get 10 questions, I have now 500 questions. Now, those 500 questions give me an idea to create my agenda for the class. I also create answers to these 500 questions and create this what we call knowledge repository or frequently asked question knowledge repository and make it available to all. 
So now these 500 questions answered itself is another source of material which is available to them. And based on this, I design now my next sessions. How, what should I cover? How should I cover? And what all different things uh, would be the part of the class. So this is another, uh, this is where I was mentioning that it has an impact on it, teachers uh, to change the pedagogical models. Um, I remember, uh, you know, the students never used to be the co-constructor of a knowledge. Students used to think that making the presentation slides, uh, uh, discovering the material used to be the sole responsibility of the teachers. And nowadays the things have changed. Now, in fact, many of the students become the co-constructor of the knowledge. While I create these 500 questions answers, many times the students come back to me and provide me more pointers that this may be the better uh, site or information source where this is explained much better. And also many times, many of my students are also uh, taking the similar courses uh, in, in the sites like MOOCs or Coursera. So they also help me to say, the example cited by another professor from another institution may demonstrate better than the one you are demonstrating here. So as I was mentioning, constructivism, our co-constructor of knowledge responsibility has become part of both teacher and the learners. So this is the scenario. And now based on this, uh, we are trying to create not only a, a, a common material, but we are also supposed to be uh, uh, catering to the different learning styles. I have become a part of this community called Community of Practice. I'm sure many of you also are. And basically what it means that you share your best practices with each other. So you not only know how you are handling your course, but you also know through your friends and colleagues in other institutions how they are doing in their courses. And because of that, uh, there is a huge enrichment in, in, in your own uh, teaching and research. So community of practice has become the order of the day. When I was Growing up as an academician, I used to think that one of the biggest accomplishment I have is I go in a class and I, uh, I explain students uh, about some of those concepts. And if I'm able to explain concepts well, uh, that's, that's the accomplishment, that's the achievement. But later on, I found it's not just explaining any concept. But how to, what formats would be more appropriate? What would be the best way? And that's where the uh, concept of whether you should use, uh, you know, the pedagogy, um, the discussion-based pedagogy or what we call case-based approach, whether it's a lecture, whether it's a role play or anything else. And that becomes kind of uh, another part of the teaching that one has to focus on. It is not just to consider that you go in a class and you explain, but how those things could be made more effective and more impactful. Um, so there is a change on the faculty uh, environment. There's a change in the technology environment, and there's a change even in the classrooms. Flipped classroom has become the main key word and that flipped classroom basically means that you can transfer much of the teaching through your videos or other online resources and make it available to the students for them to read at home and mainly you you ask uh, they they can go through all that material and then when they come to the class they can they can use that opportunity for verifying or cross-verifying what they have learned. So the whole classroom scenario has been flipped uh, with, with the new technologies. Transparent uh, assessment, the many of the assessments now the students 
want to know the rubrics or the metrics that we use for evaluating them. They, they need to be objective and they need to be transparent, but particularly when the competition is so intense. And they're using a lot of these uh, video-driven uh, new learning models, both at their end and at, uh, uh, you know, at, the, at the instructor end. In fact, I record most of my videos uh, and make it available, uh, even a short, short snippet for explaining things other than my live classroom for synchronous uh, teaching, for synchronous learning. And some of this uh, has helped again um, the, the teaching pedagogies, but also the uh, the, 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 it has changed the expectation. So every one of us are expected to follow these new pedagogical models. And since these students, many of them are also these Gen G students uh, who, who have a different learning styles, it fits well into their expectations. So uh, just to sum up, before I start taking question, I just wanted to paint the scenario that the, the 21st century is much different than the past century. Technology is the major uh, driving factor for changing the teaching, the learning, and not only it provides the opportunity, but it is also the challenge at the same time you would be um, interacting with the students on 24-7 basis. I remember sometime I get an email uh, 12 o'clock, 12 uh, in the night, and by four o'clock they want the answers because someone's uh, are working uh, for their assignment, which may be due next day. And since they're working late night, they're expecting the teacher also to work late night and answer their questions. Uh, for completion of that uh, assignment. In fact, I had another interesting experience. I gave an assignment and the student came with the answers and I never expected that students would have uh, those, those uh, assignments solved. So uh, next day I asked them that you have done a wonderful job, but how did it happen? And they told me that some of their uh, friends or relatives uh, are in the teaching, uh, are teaching faculty in some other parts of the world. They shared this assignment with them. They solved it and they provided it to me <laughs> without ever understanding what this problem was all about. So th those are the technology challenges that now you have to figure out who's a student on the other side, who, how these uh, uh, home assignments are completed. Um, I also mentioned that the teacher's role is changing now. It's not going to be a traditional teaching in the classroom, particularly the classrooms are becoming the virtual classrooms. And also the uh, teachers are becoming more and more facilitators that you try to provide the pointers or you become the co-constructor of the knowledge. Um, so teacher role is changing. The students' roles are changing since they are becoming the co-constructor of the knowledge. Uh, I remember in other classroom experience, I allow students to use the laptops and uh, uh, the phones or any of the gadgets. And many times uh, I had a curiosity to know while I'm lecturing, what are they doing? And sometime I figured out if I'm explaining some concept, at the same time they are going to the other sites and trying to validate whether what I'm sharing is relevant or it is uh, the fact. So it is another uh, responsibility now on the instructors that you have to be fact-driven. You have to be evidence-based. All those are the new uh, challenges for a new faculty because those are becoming the trends in the new environment. Uh, so uh, as I had mentioned in the beginning and also with Dr. Sharma, that uh, I will take this opportunity just to set, uh, to, to, to share some of my thoughts in the beginning, and it will be much more fruitful if I can answer the questions that you have for me. 
So again, thank you very much, Dr. Bhardwaj, Dr. Mishra, Dr. Sharma, for making me uh, a part of this event, this webinar, and I'll provide me this opportunity to share my thoughts and probably interact with many of my new friends in that part of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful hearing you and uh, your insights into the developing and the uh, underdeveloped world. Thank you so much. And it is also uh, enlightening to hear that uh, the difference in uh, difference in both sides, because as you uh, portrayed that uh, there are different age groups of people, the demographics of education is changing. And... Uh, uh, but we don't see that happening here very often. That That is rare in this part of the world. So this was a contrast that I felt in your talk. And apart from this, sir, I would like to uh, know your views on the future of education in the developed and the develop, developing world, especially after the COVID-19 impact. So do you foresee any any differences in the pattern of education or the pedagogical differences that may arise due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. Of course, uh, COVID-19 will have not just uh, the impact only for coming few weeks and months, but maybe for uh, once for all. It will change the whole education model. The number one first thing which is happening is now all the faculty members are forced to learn, use the technologies, use of these technologies. So virtual platforms is now as the main requirement for faculty member to be a faculty member. Uh, I know that in my college, uh, I had to train around 100 faculty members within a short window of two to three weeks time, how to not only use the Zoom or WebEx or any such uh, platforms, but how to embed YouTube or many other similar tools into their lectures. So that, you know, the uh, gone are the days when faculty member was more concerned about his lecture side of it. Now using technology itself is a requirement to be a good faculty. Number two, the class uh, size has, the definition of class size is changing. You know, there, were, there was a time when many of us used to have a luxury that a class size cannot be more than 40 student or 50 student because, you know, that, that'll, uh, mm, be most effective for both students and a faculty member to perform. Now the class size is in hundreds because the operational efficiencies to run this virtual <laughs> environment uh, um, requires that you have, you may have to cater to the students who may not be physically available on campus, but they're all over. And uh, on one hand, this is an opportunity for in universities to to grab more enrollments or to have more enrollments. On other hand, the, it will have impact on the class sizes. It will have impact on the pedagogy because now the pedagogical, uh, you know, those uh, uh, constraints are limitation again, a group size, those definitions are changing. What would you call as a group, uh, you know, and a group assignment or group work? So that is another side of the impact to which one has to cater. And the most important is that when I go in a class, I have to benchmark myself with the global standard. I'm no more teaching in a small school, uh, you know, a, here in uh, Indiana, because my lectures through this virtual environment may be available to the worldwide. And first, I want to make that available worldwide for the simple reason that I can attract students. I can attract students in that course. And I, you already must be hearing the stories 
that many of the Coursera and MOOCs classes, half a million or a quarter of a million students are in one class. And the professors, with the help of some of the graduate assistant or teaching assistants, are catering, are uh, working for uh, those courses. So the definition of classroom is changing, the definition of class size is changing, uh, the, the way the professors handle the classroom is completely different uh, and would be having a long-term impact uh, after this COVID-19. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Uh, the the so my next. Paris, uh, Dr. Yes, sir. Dr. Paris, yes. Before you before you uh, go for the other question, uh, will you will you please introduce yourself to the guest and others so I'm that. So uh, 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 sir, I'm really I apologize for that. Uh, I'm Dr. Prakash. I have uh, done uh, my doctoral program in pharmacology, clinical pharmacology. And I have also done an MBA in uh, um, uh, marketing and management. So uh, after that, I'm heading here, uh, the Department of Pharmacy, actually. And we've been doing some FDPs uh, revolving around the topic that you've been covering today. And uh, moreover, we in that FDP learned that there are different type of learners. Nine different type of learners are there. And our uh, education system has to revolve around that nine different types of learners. If I, if I recollect, there are, there are different kind of learners such as visual, kinesthetic, auditory, stress, ease, scribble, trust, teach, and copy. So there are, there are uh, interesting aspect, uh, their aspect, because, because you touched upon the different type of learners that we have today in the world today. Uh, so moving on uh, to to the next question that I have from the panel is the role. Pleasure meeting, Dr. Prakash. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, sir. The, the role of ICT. How do you foresee the role of uh, ICT in the new age education? So, in fact, uh, it's a very good question, and uh, it's it's also uh, you know in other way there. You know, we used to call this ICT. Uh, in fact, I, I it reminds me that when I was growing up and I was going through this engineering program, the world at that time was a computer in early 70s. And then uh, later on when I graduated, then this computer world got changed into IT, information technology. And then later on in 80s and 90s, that IT became ICT. Yeah. And now I'm thinking that these, these words, relevance, have gone away because ICT has become part of life. So that time we used to differentiate that, you know, this is a computer, this is an information technology, this is information and communication technologies. And more of these words were related with the computer as one of the main tools. And now you could see that the power of those computers in the 70s and 80s have gone into these smartphones. And every gadget you use, I use my this uh, some of the wristwatch, which records my daily temperature. It records my the walk, uh, the steps every day. It tells me my diets, uh, what diets I should be able to take it and all that. And right. this automatically gets uploaded through apps to my profile and automatically goes to my physician. My physician keeps sending me the uh, reminders that, you know, you have walked uh, 100 miles in this week, but you need to catch up with another 20 miles. So the definition of ICT has Absolutely. changed and it has become a and, part of our life. <laughs> and so with, with the Internet of Things coming in and uh, artificial intelligence playing a major role, I see the uh, the platform of education changing quite, quite massively than we can perhaps even imagine today. It is. And one of the offshoot which I do now is that as part of the analytics, uh, when I go, when I upload the material on WebCT or Blackboard or Canvas or any of these uh, LMS uh, tools, and not only uh, I could see at the back end that who has accessed this material for how many hours or how many minutes and how many times. 
So I can create a scenario where I know how, how students are accessing my material or how much attention they are paying to. And I can again send them the reminders that you have not opened your this file or you have not uh, even opened this assignment and you need to go there and this may take this much time. So I'm trying to point those pointers. So all these analytics itself are helping the teachers to know as we were talking about not only the learning style, but how the students are, uh, how much time they are spending to learning the material. Uh, so the more and more use of AI tool or more and more of uh, machine learning, those will be additional resource available to the faculty member for an, enhancing their own teaching effectiveness. Right, sir. Right, sir. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question that has come to me is uh, how to measure productivity, uh, productivity and accountability in the e-learning based platform because uh, it becomes when you talk about uh, the students especially uh, and millions of millions of them uh, in platforms like Coursera etc so uh, it becomes very difficult to have accountability of all the students uh, available and that uh, brings a fear in my mind that uh, the quality may be compromised Great question, and this is one of the fear which many of us, we had it when we began even the virtual platform. In a small way, uh, in early 2000, uh, here we, I became a part of MBA program. Uh, I had around 100 students on campus, and I had around 300 students off campus who were taking my classes online. And one of the first concern, uh, like many others, I had was that this will be a not only huge work for me, but maybe the quality will be compromised, both at my end, uh, I may not have enough time to cater to the needs of the students, or prepare assignments and material which would, would have been more effective in a smaller class sizes. But all those, uh, you know, all those notions are, uh, and not really valid anymore. Uh, if you could be effective in a class of 50 students, you could be effective in a class of half a million students. I think what you are saying is in terms of the resources available to cater to the needs of the higher number of students, you may have to spend, uh, you may have to uh, support your faculty members with those additional resources. So initially I used to have a one graduate assistant or one teaching assistant to help me, who would either help me proctoring the exams or who will help me to, uh, you know, evaluating those uh, exams. Uh, but now I have like five, I have 10, and they're also getting groomed in this process to be a teacher for similar settings in the future. So quality again is a relative concept. Uh, what one thinks is a quality may not be quality for other or work may be a huge quality for other. Uh, but I think those notions may not be as valid that, you know, the size would make a huge difference. Right, sir. Right, sir. Uh, so that brings me to the last uh, from the panel that I have. Uh, hardship in doing lab work on the e-learning platform because especially in the department that I uh, come from, we have a lot of uh, uh, lab work that goes on. And uh, because the virtual thing happening, it becomes very difficult to uh, get get the students to experience the chemical reactions and the uh, other uh, experiments that we do. So what is your take on that and how are you managing in your university the same uh, kind of scenario? Yeah, this is another great challenge for all of us. Um, there are the few courses which are of a huge challenge and particularly lab-based courses. And in my uh, field also, uh, let me give you an example. So one of the course I used to teach where I need to expose the students how the assembly line or industry works or a typical manufacturing plant works. 
and how the different business functions are interrelated with each other. So uh, think of, you know, if uh, somebody wants to make a car, like a Ford is planning to make a car, uh, to explain student that it has to buy a material from the raw materials, uh, it has to buy the raw materials from the suppliers, and then within the factory there may be a number of different uh, um, divisions or departments through which this raw material will be processed to make a product. And once this is made as a product, then this needs to be market out. And there are the other business functions. So on one hand, it may be a accounting uh, account account uh, accounting department which will be involved for account payable and account receivable on other hand it may be a marketing department where sales order processing that they need to receive some sales order and they need to send these uh, finished products to the warehouses or to the dealers and finally dealers to the customers and there may be a finance now you need it for all this or there may be engineering who would uh, look at the design part of it. So how to explain this whole factory environment unless you take them to a factory? So Absolutely. what I did was that uh, I started using some of the three-dimensional tools and started creating these small, small, either what we call digital storytelling or even animations. So now in animation, in animated movie, I show them, so this is a raw material created. It's like a film. And when they see these films kind of a thing, they have a better understanding than actually going to the factory. So many of these lab-based uh, uh, exercises or uh, experiences here in my institution and many institutions, they are getting uh, uh, recorded, video recorded, so the instructor record himself or herself. This is how a typical lab I am doing. There is a you know one student or another uh, graduate assistant who is part of this exercise. He explain each of these steps, how these, how what happens, and then right. the students are doing on their own at home and they record their videos and send back to the professor and professor evaluates that. Same way in some other cl classrooms, we help the students to record their videos for various other similar things. And we, you know, the results we are processing, and of course, it will be very different than what we are traditionally used to be, but uh, it, it, it still is very effective. Right, sir. Right. So thank you for the insights. That will be all from my side, sir. So nice speaking to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> Uh, hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, pretty good. Uh, it was really a very nice uh, conversation, rather, I can say, instead of taking it to the lecture, because more of it was uh, just an interact in the interactive way. Uh, before uh, we proceed further, I thank Dr. Paras Prakash really doing a wonderful job because he was made the coordinator to have the questions from the, all the faculty members. Uh, as for the tradition, though we are late for that, I request uh, Dr. Ravinesh Mishraji uh, to please uh, introduce the speaker so that everybody should know about the speaker. And uh, yes, his video should be on. Uh, like with Chaitanya, whenever somebody is interacting, the other person is saying his video should be made on. So, uh, now I hand over it to the Dr. Ravinesh. He is a professor in uh, pharmacy college. And then uh, he is also dean student welfare. He is also holding the charge of the direct admissions of the university. So, uh, will you please, I request him to please introduce uh, about the speak, main speaker. The meeting, Dr. Mishra. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, very inspirational talk titled Changing Landscape of Higher Education at the Global Scenario. So, it's a great pleasure um, to listen to you at a, such a virtual platform. So thank you so much, sir. I listened to your means whole talk. 
so for the viewer sides so i feel honored to introduce our guest speakers panelist and host side so here the key speakers for today's session is professor dr sosil sharma associate dean professor of computer information system miller college of business ball state university indiana usa apart from this we have panelist like a renowned scientist dr r k sharma he is a food and agriculture specialist former director national horticulture board india senior advisor new leaf holland now it is netherland and our honorable vice chancellor professor dr t r bhardwaj of badd university of emerging science and technology sir is a polymer research scientist of various target drug delivery system and developing a very new molecules and having more than 20 us patents and many more is under in process then professor dr sonlata sharma from hp agriculture university palampur india then our worthy registrar professor dr jk sharma sir also here vice president indian society of seed technology right now sir is dean school of agriculture sciences of badd university emerging science and technology and for the viewer now i will uh, introduce the profile and a very short profile of our key speaker professor dr sushil sharma dr sushil sharma is currently an associate dean and a professor of computer information system in the miller college of business at ball state university his journey of academia began at pune teaching at symbiosis university bharti vidya peet university as a visiting faculty in mid 80s before he joined full time at iim lucknow where he taught for 10 years before immigrating to the united states as a visiting faculty he taught at iit kanpur iit delhi and other iims of india he was also an advisor to the up government on it and education and in fact he was the author of the first it policy of the up during his days at iim he used to write a popular cyber space column in the times of india titled as the emerging impact of it on the society he was also featured in doordarshan and gtv for his work on it he was an advisor and consultant to the world bank and usaid funded project in india this is a very small write up and we can't sum up the profile of such renowned speakers in few lines apart from this we have the panelist professor dr ak sharma professor dr r k sharma former director of national horticulture board of government of india has served at various national and international level he had been horticulture advisor to the australian high commission for 5 years and core experts in horticulture post harvest and marketing divisions with fao of united nations under south cooperation program for 5 years looking after countries in the horn of africa dr sharma had been closely associated with the horticulture policy planning for the last 40 years with a special contribution is the introduction of the concept of integrated projects in horticulture rather than isolated components based development and cold chain development in a city of government of india through a task force technical standard committee member secretary and finally developing protocols for verification certification of cold chain components linking to the level of incentives dr sharma also act as secretary national oil seed vegetable oil seed development board government of india sir has created 20 papers various books and 40 journals wrote one review book and five review articles sir is fellow of the global cold chain alliance us where he has attended it technical program gcca institute he has worked for many developmental and commercial projects of 
USDA, ZFA, FORUN, NIEM, Niti Ayog, Ministry of Food Processing Industries, and Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India. Dr. Sharma is a freelance consultant at national and international projects currently as international experts with ZIZ for Afghanistan Economic Development and senior advisors to New Leaf, Netherlands. So that is the, again a very short profile of our panelist, Dr. R.P. Sarma. Then as already we know the profile of our Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Dr. T. R. Bhardwaj, that is a academician and researcher in the field of pharmaceutical sciences. Sir is having more than 300 research publications, more than 20 US patents, and five, six Indian patents are still in the pipeline. And currently here at Baddi University, we are involved in the targeted drug delivery research systems, colon targeted cancer research. Apart from this, we are developing this anti-malarial pro-drug polymer linked new molecules and many more, sir. Apart from this, I also wish to introduce Ms. Professor Dr. Paras Prakash. Uh, I think uh, from, uh, some issue. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, yeah. no problem. And if not, some issue with him. So, so uh, uh, I think that uh, most of the things he has done, which was required for uh, all that, I really uh, thank him very much for doing the, a wonderful job. Now, uh, uh, we have uh, with us. Uh, the most reputed person, Dr. R.K. Sharma, who has the global experience uh, in agriculture and uh, uh, processing, uh, agriculture processing throughout the world. So I request him to give just a brief uh, of that, uh, the outcome of uh, today's, uh, uh, the program which was held and the, the beautiful uh, which was beautifully delivered by Professor Sharma from US. So, Dr. Sharma, please, Dr. R.K. Sharma, please to give your comments. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Please. Hello, hello, Sushir, are you good? Pleasure meeting, sir. Yeah, I. Um, Thank Dr. Sushil and more so the University for uh, planning this platform for knowledge exchange, which really is the need of the hour because many institutes and universities are struggling to fight the way out to continue with the education system, and also especially in view of the crunch of resources. And uh, in developing countries like India, the situation is a big gap between the software part, the, that's the digital application of the issues for teaching and field application. Uh, whereas people have hardware enough means in terms of knowledge and uh, experience, but uh, they're finding it difficult to take it to the field. Um, for example, those students who are in India and studying in the universities in US or Europe, they are well connected to the developments there and continue their courses from India as well. But when we talk of Indian students getting connected to the Indian professors in the reputed universities even, that uh, hardware part of their knowledge taking to the students really proving to be difficult. So Professor, uh, so SEAL has really given a very broad spectrum of issues of higher learning and difficulties in that. But I will dwell more on the practical part of that as well. Citing two examples. I was in a conversation with the Vice Chancellor of the IIT Delhi, how they are crippling with this problem after COVID-19 situation. 
for imparting the higher education to the students. So there are three, four uh, big problems. The last five months has struggled for that. Say, for example, they said that their faculty, they have good knowledge and hardware to be them, but they were not attuned to teach through virtual system and platforms because it's easy to teach a particular theme of a subject through photograph, through blackboard, through machines and all that. But taking those systems to the place where students are in their villages, the remote areas, they had to first train their faculty for two months how to go, go get oriented towards the application of scientific field for the people. When they got uh, tuned to that, second problem they came up with the students, they were not having the modern computers compatible with the higher learning of the science-based models for IITs. So the university did a very big job of procuring good computers, supplying them to the homes so that they're able to learn through that. And then when the course started, they had big problem the last month that they were not able to teach the students who are in the remote villages. As you know, in the government system of admissions, there are quotas. And mostly tribal students, they come from the very tribal areas where the connectivity for internet is very, very poor. So they said that we are the most downtrodden people. We can't get education. So they do something for us and then we and go for higher learning like this through computer, through digital program, through virtual classrooms. And the university decided, because these students constitute about 10% of the total students. So they decided to bring them back to the hostels, open the mess, start cooking, and everything again. So you can imagine, they took minimum five months to take the hardware knowledge, which the people have, eminence they have with them, but taking it to the rural people where they really need it more. Okay. That's so difficult. Okay. So we're taking hardware to the software is really a little problem in countries like us. Okay. And then they can do it with the government expenses for a year or so, but think of private universities, the way they have to generate their own resources. Okay. And even they can do for a year or two, but the government cannot always do them some okay. you know, big sums to undertake such ventures. So really, it's a source of situation, and here learning is a very big challenge. Uh, second part, you can see that the, even the entrance examination to the NEET and Z is a big problem. The governments are planning to go to even Supreme Court to stall it, which means that students were not able to appear. Again, they're going to lose another year for getting to the elite institution. So after COVID uh, situation, these problems are really cropping up in the higher education, and these are more so in the developing world. Another example I can tell uh, how the problems are coming up in the, on the practical front. You know, the uh, all this uh, industry of precision farming, say greenhouses, uh, the hydroponics where the cultivation of modern pesticide-free produce is available, or even the management of cold stores where they load the produce, when is to be taken out, the retrieval of the produce, it all requires the application of the uh, mindset. But since the labor and the technical labor is not available to do the job now at the greenhouses or the hydroponics units or at the cold stores or in the refuel transport system, uh, so produce is wasting, getting waste all over the country. So those not the, the, the big companies who install the system in the developing nation, basically in the Middle East, even in countries like India, where they have modern greenhouses, companies from New Zealand and US, they invested here. But now running those units is not becoming profitable because there is no trained manpower to do so. Yeah. And to train such manpower, they require the, as Mishrap explained, the classroom labs issues and practical problems in that. So enough technician to be trained or enough research to be done by higher education to meet these growing challenges of pesticides, new varieties, climate change, adaptability, uh, high level of production. So all those challenges are to be met through you know higher education and descending down to the technicians and then doing it. So it's a big problem all over the world now with the 
because people have knowledge, but then the digital artificial knowledge application is not available. So hence, even if you have enough, you are not able to see it is enough or take it further. So this is a very common thing, and I understand this is a big issue with the universities as well. There the practical part of imparting education is a huge challenge. And in these circumstances, if the but the university has organized this platform and connecting people, I hope that some dynamics may take place around who are listening and things will improve. And uh, I conclude that this is a good initiative and all the colleagues and friends and scientists and vice chancellor and Sushil and Mishra, everybody is highly uh, knowledge base and contributing to this. These words, I thank you, Sushil and university. And if there's anything practically to be developed upon, I will be available to speak on that. Not directly the higher education, but as the offshoot to the education. Thank you. Very sure. Thank So, so it is uh, uh, really that uh, under Indian context, the earlier we we heard Dr. Shishtinji from global context, but uh, under Indian context, how this COVID-19 it has uh, put us all, not we all, but uh, each and every. Human, uh, human uh, in this country, they are put in such a difficult part. How to get around the problems which have been now generating day by day due to COVID? And particularly in the educational sector, how the practical portion we are lacking, but Dr. Prakash, uh, he showed his concern uh, that somebody has to put this question Really, this is the main uh, flaw in our system nowadays when the online teaching, online classes are there. Uh, we need to confess it and uh, how we have to follow it, how we have to resolve it. This is a main issue. And this is not only here. Globally, globally it is being... Uh, that's why... The, the when the question uh, when the this was uh, explained by Dr. R. K. Sharma about uh, the IITNs, uh, how or uh, this NEET and the JE examinations, uh, their conduct is being suffered. So such a wider knowledge system which has been provided to us, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, those type of the knowledgeable uh, and valuable points to bring in the knowledge of all of us. Thank you very much again. Now I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor T.R. Bhardwajji, uh, to please uh, come up and uh, give his uh, views on the entire this program. <laughs> Hello, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Dr. Cecil Sharma, Dr. R.K. Sharma, uh, other members, panelists, and participants. Today's webinar delivered by Professor Sushil Sharma pertaining to excellence in changing landscape of higher education was excellent. As we all know that, as is said by the speaker also, that 21st century is the technology-driven century. There is little doubt about that. And the parameters or the prevention measures which are to be taken with respect to the teaching, learning process, they are there. But, but when it comes to the institutions of higher learning or the universities in particular, you see. So these are the centers of creation of knowledge dissemination of knowledge. So that part is okay. But what we feel personally as a researcher, as said by Dr. Parth Prakash also, as well as Dr. R. K. Sharma also, is that research and development is an integral part of the teaching and learning process. 
and as you said that there is no master more master than your own experience and experience can only be attained gain specifically in those areas professional areas specifically maybe agriculture maybe medical maybe engineering maybe pharmacy also by doing that uh, with hand or learning in the actual factory or industry or others so that that is concern of all of us maybe from the vice chancellor of iit or rk sharma or dr shreel also others are also feeling so in that area what could be the possible alternative uh, approaches which could be taken care so that the covid 19 epidemic era can be uh, used an opportunity with respect to the learning process teacher learning process specifically with respect to research and development so of course there are some uh, programs which are being developed but finally it has to be the practical aspect on this so i would like to again thank dr sushil sharma for his contributions specifically <laughs> he must have woke up in the morning <laughs> because because it must be very early in the morning in the us at that time of course we are that it's evening for us so thank you very much for that and uh, we may again travel you in future for webinar later to as well as we would like to have webinar in the next session with the dr rk sharma also thank you very much thank you again over to dr jk sharma please uh thank you sir sir thank you very much for your and uh, the, the comments on the higher education how we can go ahead uh, how these uh, the the blessings from these people uh, it has come to uh, help the bad university in the near future uh virtually if we see that uh, we are at uh, it is 6 uh, o'clock about 6 o'clock in the evening for the people over here but uh, professor sushil sharma uh, he was ready to uh, be interactive with us uh, just before from 6 am from the us now we as teachers we need to understand that uh, the level of dedication toward teaching the love the affection dedication faith you call anything so that is the level he has attained and when he attended all of us so it means in a one go so many people who have joined this webinar over here their thoughts and uh, their future uh, futurist approach towards the teaching it must have changed professor sharma the way you dealt the entire issue of higher education globally and uh, giving its impact that how the the product of the our students passing our students or even the presently how we have to go ahead with our studies over there that will always be remain of uh, this uh, very helpful to the people we will be using all those technology we will be we will be making use of that yes uh, sure i missed one question uh, in between that uh, uh as earlier also we were uh, on contact for that that we want to collaborate with your university but the university want to have some collaboration with your university so if it is the system then uh, because all of us uh, all of our uh, higher uh, uh, educationists and the office bearers they are here so uh, all should know and it should be brought into their mind that how but the university can be a part of the system of your university or or or, or the usa so may i request you to please uh, surely surely um it was a pleasure uh, interacting and virtually meeting with 
so many distinguished accomplished personalities like dr sharma dr bhardwaj dr prakash and many others who i am not able to directly interact but i could see their profile is uh, excellent so what happens in terms of collaboration we have uh, collaboration around the world with various schools so there are different levels of collaboration the first i always suggest that this is the one way that we can start involving some speakers from each different discipline like pharmacology or agriculture sciences or others and teacher to teacher connections are very important once you start having teacher to teacher connections it helps to share the best practices both ways and it enriches their own experiences then offshoot of that also is uh, to do a, some joint research so again for that uh you know once you have teacher to teacher connection for some of the phd students there could be a co guide co supervisors and again that can result into a good collaborative research opportunities and third level where the faculty members from badi university could visit us could could spend some time again depending upon the resources they could spend a week to a month to a semester to a year again working with the faculty members on this side and seeing how the classes the same classes are delivered differently what different pedagogical tools are used or even work with the with the, some of the research projects jointly and see how uh, you know how comparatively they are different than the the project which are done in uh, in back home in by the university third level is student exchange so there are different types of student exchange programs one could be that uh, students from the badi university during the summer they could visit for again week to two weeks to three weeks time window and this could be a kind of cultural awareness uh, understanding the educational uh, experiences of us universities and we have such um tours or such such visits from some of the other indian universities and they they go through this just to sit in the classrooms during the summer when they are able to do it so these are the various levels of collaborations so one can think of teacher to teacher teacher visiting ball state or ball state faculty visiting by the university uh some of the administrator as part of the delegation can come and see uh, what these universities are all about so with you i invite you to have a visit to our uh, uh, our university now i am part of the business college uh, but i would able to connect you with the people in biology or pharmacy or pharmacology or other departments where uh, uh, with those pointers you can get connected with them um later on as the trust builds up then it could go to some student exchange program in the beginning short duration as i said it could be few visits or even in some cases i do i teach uh, virtually in the countries like new zealand turkey singapore kabul and many of the time i put the students what we call in virtual teams so some of my students from this class and students who i'm teaching in that university they work together as a virtual teams and that itself is experience learning from each other it's called peers uh, learning uh, that that experience enriches them and also make them to understand the diversity because we are part of this diverse uh, environment where uh, as part of the global citizen you will be interacting with people from different culture from different language from different countries on day to day basis and some of these things could be done easily through these collaborative opportunities once they get established to some extent then one can think of even the last level which is called uh, uh, giving credits or recognizing credits from each other where students can spend a semester or a year 
And then the last of this opportunity, we have some program with Chinese universities, with Malaysian universities, with Vietnam. It's called two plus two program. So students spend two years in their home countries and then they come to US for two years and then they get the dual degrees. They get degree from the home university and they get the degree from the US university. This program has been very popular, particularly with South Asian countries and more so because many of the undergraduate degree in South Asian countries of three years. And when the students after their three years degree wants to uh, come to US for higher education, they, uh, they are not accepted because they need to have four years uh, college degree after their high schools. And for that, sometimes they have to do another master's or another year in their home country before they're accepted for graduate programs in US. Although uh, of late, some of the U.S. universities are willing to take students even with three years degree as long as they meet the requirements of some credit hours. But that used to be one of the driving factors where, where many of the South Asian countries send their students as part of the two plus two years program. And there is some kind of a discount uh, given in terms of the fees which is charged from the students. But the advantage is students go with the two degrees. It makes them uh, at par with other international students to join U.S. institution uh, for higher education. As you are also aware that many of the U.S. Uh, institutions after undergraduate degree, four years undergraduate degree, uh, if the students have a high GPA, they can directly join the Ph.D. programs or the, you know, the... Um, master's program. So that makes them much, much more attractive to be a part of this two plus two uh, dual degree program. So that those are also opportunities. So it can begin at a lower level just to have these webinars and then developing a trust among the faculty member, also among the administrators, and slowly graduate to the next level of collaboration where one could have a dual degrees uh, finally, um, uh, which which helps the student as well as the institutions. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Sharma, for such a, a beautiful and a nice depiction of all the programs which uh, uh, we can make use of with your help or uh, even by exploring the opportunities in other universities too. I uh, actually, uh, from my core part as well as uh, my entire faculty, including our honorable vice chancellor, then all the deans of the different colleges, uh, the heads of the departments, other faculty who has joined this program. On behalf of the, uh, all of them, I really thank you very much. I don't know how many times I have to say it, that thousand <laughs> times you can accept in, in the one go, that uh, you acceded to our this request and uh, you spared your time. Now I can understand that uh, you are very busy now, you have to go to, directly to the university, <laughs> where you have to interact with the... So many things you were sharing that uh, now uh, you started your university, but uh, in the first day, you got uh, 22 positive cases. So now the, you have to take the decision whether to continue or just to discontinue the, the calling of the students to the university for the purpose. So with the it, was, it was a pleasure to uh, be part of this webinar and share my thoughts and my experience with many of you. And I look forward for many more interactions in the future, wherever I could be of any help for establishing this collaboration uh, between Badi University and institution here in the U.S., I'll be more than happy to do that. So thank you very much. I enjoyed my interaction with the Badi University and with all the distinguished personalities. Uh, I know that uh, you have been... Uh, you and Dr. Sharma, R.K. Sharma, have been my role model while growing up. Uh, you know, um, I, I still have a vivid memory that, uh, you know, we all wanted to be uh, in academia and we all wanted to accomplish uh, certain things in our career. And being part of this gathering 
makes me a good uh, feeling, uh, good proud of it. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward for many more interaction in the future. So much this is for the gratitude and all. Thank you, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, you too. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Okay. Fine, sir.